This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for July 1st, 2020. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, as the number of people infected in the outbreak has continued to grow, we're now able to identify more unusual manifestations of the infection. This week, we've published two reports about one of these syndromes, a collection of symptoms that affects a small group of children and adolescents. What did we learn in these reports? Well, Steve, I think it's important to point out first that very few children develop symptoms of COVID-19, and the vast majority of those who do only have mild disease. So what we're talking about here is an exceptional group, a small group of very severely ill children and adolescents. And it's pretty striking that they should develop this in the background of what's really a mild or probably largely asymptomatic disease. This syndrome was first described in Europe. It was initially called Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome Temporally Associated with SARS-CoV-2, or PIMS-TS. I guess that that name is a little bit clunky, and when the CDC came up with their case definition, they came up with a different name, Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome of Children, or MISC. And though the case definitions, as we'll discuss, are a little bit different that are used even within the U.S. in the two studies that we used, and between the U.S. and Europe, but really these are clearly the same syndromes or strongly overlapping syndromes. So the two studies we have are from two different groups. One is from the New York State Department of Public Health, and they required reporting of infectious disease syndromes from their hospitals, those located within the state, and the CDC, which collected cases from 38 hospitals that were participating in an active surveillance program, actually for flu, and then they added 15 additional sites. The two groups, as I said, used similar but not identical case definitions, but more or less the cases are pretty comparable. The case definitions included prominently fever, signs of inflammation, and some evidence of COVID-19 infection or recent exposure to COVID-19 in the absence of testing. The evidence could be a positive RT-PCR test to show that there was virus in the uh, patient or serologic evidence of recent infection, or of course, evidence of linkage to an epidemiologically to a case. So if you kind of amalgamate over the two of them, the New York State group screened 191 patients who had some elements of it and identified 95 cases, which they called confirmed by their case definition, and four additional suspects who had not had testing for COVID-19, but had similar syndromes. The CDC, which allowed contacts, described 186 cases, and these were more geographically distributed. Most of them had pretty firm evidence of COVID-19 infection, but interestingly, infection had occurred a few weeks before the onset of the entire syndrome. They had a number of symptoms, and there are detailed descriptions of their symptoms, their presentations, and their clinical courses. They ranged in age from neonates to age 20. There was a variety of ethnicities in this report. Roughly three quarters of them were previously healthy, had no pre existing conditions that we would associate with COVID 19. But a quarter of them had something, but most of those were obesity, which we know in adults is a risk for more severe disease. Now, these kids were very sick. The vast majority of them required ICU care. Some of them ended up on ventilators or even on ECMO. Thus far, there were only six deaths among all of the patients in the two groups combined, but many of them remain hospitalized, so we don't know what's going to be the ultimate outcome of the disease. So what were the symptoms? There were multi-systems. It had to involve more than one organ system, but commonly the patients had prolonged fevers, rashes, conjunctivitis and mucositis respiratory symptoms progressing to respiratory insufficiency in some kids, and commonly GI symptoms. Some had neurologic symptoms as well, including headache and altered mental status. Now, one of the most striking parts, though, are cardiac abnormalities, and those included evidence, biochemical evidence of cardiac injury, 
heart failure and a variety of echocardiographic abnormalities, and several of them required vasopressors for support. Eric, as you note, I mean, this is a distinct syndrome, but it is important, as you suggested, to put it in context in that we don't truly know the denominator of children who have been infected. And that plays into many aspects of understanding COVID across the board. You know, what role do children play in amplifying, in spreading? How often do they get infected? But what this cluster of cases point out to us is that there are certain syndromes that are quite distinct and severe related to COVID infection, but we really don't know how often this occurs. The data to date suggests it's quite rare, but we all wish we had better denominator data so people could understand the true risk. It's an unusual collection of symptoms. Are there other syndromes that resemble this in any way? Well, there are two syndromes that have been described in the past that are very reminiscent of this. One is toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock is caused by a bacterial toxin. It has some of the same manifestations, including a high fever, rash, subsequent desquamation, and evidence of inflammation in many organ systems. It's not particularly a pediatric disease. It certainly can occur in kids, but it affects all ages. The other, which is a peculiarly pediatric syndrome, is Kawasaki disease, which is a symptom complex described first in Japan, as suggested by its name, and then in Hawaii and subsequently all over the world. It really shares many of the characteristics with MISC. The kids have fever and rash. Um, They also desquamate in Kawasaki disease. They have a diffuse serositis. And strikingly, a lot of them have cardiac involvement. In fact, in Kawasaki disease, the almost pathognomonic sign is a development of coronary artery aneurysms, and these have been seen in several of the MISC patients. But there are striking epidemiologic differences between Kawasaki and MISC. For one thing, Kawasaki is a disease of young children, usually under five, usually boys, and it's more common in those of Asian and Pacific Island descent. Whereas the MISC patients thus far ranged in age and in ethnicity, there didn't seem to be any particular predilection. And many of the patients described in these reports and in the European reports are older than five years old. And there's a much wider range of symptoms, including striking gastrointestinal involvement in most of the patients, which isn't seen so often in Kawasaki disease. So what's thought to be the cause of MISC? That's easy, Lindsay. I have no idea. Yeah. I would say that that's true of most of the unusual manifestations of infection with SARS-CoV-2. We know that it can infect respiratory epithelium, and that is likely to be the cause of pneumonia. We speculate, but I think with rather good evidence, that some of the systemic manifestations and late manifestations are triggered by the host immune response and excessive inflammation. But a lot of these other strange syndromes, we just don't understand. The hypercoagulability seen in this disorder, is that due to some effect on the clotting mechanisms themselves or on the endothelium? I think that there has been speculation in both directions, but we don't have direct evidence. And I think that's true for any other manifestation we've seen. But I mean, there's speculation of super antigen or some type of immune stimulation that might be contributing to these particular inflammatory states. But that's speculation. And I think it'll be interesting if it's able to be understood whether there's a genetic predisposition or a nature of the inciting event in terms of the inflammatory cascade. But I think what this does show us is that SARS CoV 2 does cause some unique features clinically. The degree of hypoxemia, the thrombotic diathesis, the inflammatory cascade, this syndrome, these are distinct features. We see them in other conditions, but that are quite prominent in the pathogenesis of disease and illness with SARS-CoV-2. And I think that 
disentangling what causes these different events, and there are likely different mechanisms, they're probably not a unifying mechanism for these different manifestations, will help us understand both the nature of injury of this virus, but also the immune response, because some of the pathogenesis might be immune related rather than direct viral injury. Lindsay, what you say about superantigens is particularly striking because toxic shock syndrome, which has some of these manifestations, is superantigen mediated. And people have speculated that about Kawasaki as well, but without any direct evidence for that. What is a little unusual here is that a minority of patients are developing these syndromes. So it's not something reproducible that we can easily find. We know that there's some host susceptibility. There are some genetic determinants of host susceptibility we discussed last week. And so perhaps there's an interaction between, say, viral antigens and specific receptors to create superantigens. But it's certainly an unusual way of developing unusual manifestations. Eric, I agree. But in thinking about the pathogenesis of this illness, one could imagine in many individuals, there is a certain amount of viral replication and in some, they clear it quickly, while others, there's more replication, more antigen created, presented, and then the ability to develop clinically diagnosable syndrome, because it has to rise above the threshold to be clinically diagnosed. And it's hard for us to know how many children or how many people in general have had subclinical illness, because that requires very broad testing to understand that. And even there, we don't know the persistence of the humoral response to diagnose it. But I think the pathogenesis is fascinating, and I agree with you. I suspect it is likely in a similar pathway as Kawasaki's and toxic shock, but that has not been established, which is why I suggested the superantigen gingerly, because I think we know so little other than the syndrome is provocative. It has overlap with other syndromes that we have more experience with. And it'll be interesting if perhaps this condition can shed light on Kawasaki's as well as the other way around. But that will require a lot more investigation. We're at an interesting time where the clinical caseload is almost exceeding our ability to take care of patients. And the science is lagging way behind that just because the pace of what's going on in hospitals and the need to take care of patients is so great that it'll probably take a while to catch up and understand the disease much better. We probably are going to be treating patients and preventing disease long before we have really good insights into pathogenesis. And I think that the pathogenesis, when you have a transient infection, may have different pathogenic inciting events than, let's say, an autoimmune process that may smolder for months to years. And so the ability to define the pathogenesis gets very tricky, depending on which aspect of the inciting event we want to understand. And viral replication, direct viral injury is probably an early event, while many of the manifestations such as endothelial injury and inflammation and immune dysregulation may be later and a consequence of an inciting event that's not as easily measured at the time we're able to measure it. And I think that that does to me in seeing these cases, what it makes me wonder is we're six months into this illness in the U.S., a little bit longer globally. And do we really understand the sequelae of illness with SARS-CoV? Do we understand the longer term sequelae? And I think this particular illness is identified because it is dramatic and has unique features, and unique features that are reminiscent of other diseases that we're used to thinking about. And I think we're going to learn, unfortunately, a bit more about the longer-term consequences of infection with this virus, just as we did with Ebola a year or two after the outbreak was over, when we understand the residual syndromes and illnesses of people who have recovered. And that, I think, is going to be an area that will require a fair amount of investigation to delineate what those manifestations might be and if there's anything we can do to ameliorate them. So getting back to the patients with MISC, what do we know about how to treat them? 
we know what people did. We don't know what was effective. What people did is the same sorts of things that they use for syndromes like Kawasaki, which is immunomodulatory treatments like intravenous immunoglobulin and high dose salicylates. And those have been shown to make a difference in Kawasaki disease, probably because they're immunomodulatory. But we don't know what's effective for this. Given this lack of knowledge, what would you advise physicians and patients to be on the lookout for? I think, number one, we have to get back to the first point, which is that most children don't get sick or don't get very sick. And the overwhelming number of them who are infected probably never show any manifestations of it or only minor manifestations. This is a very rare syndrome. However, we know nothing about who's at risk. The majority of kids had no risk factor, so it's not a question of identifying those at particular risk. And the best way to avoid getting this is to avoid getting infected in the first place. And so the same rules apply to children as apply to adults. There are many reasons to not get infected. This is one more. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lindsay.